Breaking the cycle to step forward. Authentic conversations from lived experience and a professional perspective in overcoming abuse with Chris Tuck and Beverly Ann. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Breaking the Cycle to Step Forward podcast with myself, Chris Tuck, and... Hello, I'm Beverly Ann. And we've got the really special guest today, Matthew McVarish. Have I said that correct? Yeah. Yeah. No, come on. It's a bit English. Can... It was a bit English, wasn't it, Matthew? Yeah, it's this it's like it's Bath and Bath. It's um McVarish. Oh, so you McVarish. say Matthew McVarish. Yeah. Which is <laughs> <Just> probably <laughs> right. All right, no worries. Well, I've said it once, I said it wrong, and you've corrected me, so that's that. Matthew <laughs> from now on. <laughs> <laughs> So we're just going to explore, Matthew, um, you as a person, your work, and also uh, we will be treading into areas of conversation that people are probably not going to expect us to go to today because you have got a very, very interesting, I would like to say story, but it's not a story, it's your lived experiences. So can we start right at the beginning with um, a little bit about you, your childhood, your mm -hmm. uh, teenage years, your adult years before we go on to any of your work? Is that OK? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I grew up in a town called East School Bride. It's uh, a suburb of Glasgow and uh, Irish Catholic family. I'm the youngest of seven. Uh, I always say I was born exactly nine months after Pope John Paul came to Glasgow. So <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, yeah, so very, you know, there was nine of us in a three bedroom house and it was a, it was in many ways a wonderful childhood. But um, I was basically throughout primary school and for the first three years of high school also secretly being sexually abused by my my uncle, who was my godfather. Um, and he was actually also a school teacher and he, he yeah. used to run football teams of young teen boys. Um, and at that time in the West of Scotland in the 90s in a Catholic school, in a Catholic household, you didn't speak about any of that, you know. So there was really, there was not any escape route. Um, and no, there was no one I could speak to to kind of get out of the situation. So, um, yeah, so the abuse carried on until I was 13 on the um, 24th of March 1996 is when I finally uh, stood up to him and I remember that day very clearly um, and then that was it I, I kind of said to him you can't touch me anymore and obviously I was nearly the same height as him at that point so um, so that was it and then for, the, for a couple of years after that I, he was still in our lives he would come into the house because he would he was old and he never married and he lived with my gran so he used to bring our gran over and I had to pretend for for years that everything was fine and had to I never spoke to him again after that day but no one noticed which is incredible mm -hmm. no one noticed that I never spoke to him I would bring him tea if he was in the house and stuff but it was just completely I became a master of acting like everything's fine and then when I was 15 so I guess two years later m my brother who was at university he had a complete nervous breakdown he ended up hospitalized with stress and I went to visit him. I thought, assumed that he'd been in a car accident or some kind of illness, because you know I didn't understand as at fifteen that you could end up in hospital with just overwhelm, you know. Yeah. So when I went to see him, it was really frightening because he was in the the bed at the hospital, and he looked perfectly fine. He looked healthy, but when he spoke, he was talking nonsense, and I realised that he was just mentally collapsed. And um. Yeah. He said in that state because I visited him with my dad. He said, "Oh, I was abused." by Terry, which was our uncle. And in that moment, it was the first time in my life I realized it wasn't just me. I'd assumed it was always just me because he was my godfather, I thought. And he used to say, I, you know, I was his favorite. He would buy me all sorts of crap and Lego and take me cinema and stuff. So mm -hmm. I didn't, I never imagined until that moment that it was, it was anyone else. And then of course it transpired that he'd actually abused me and three of my brothers, yeah. which is incredible because- it is. It had been going on for decades and none of us knew because we were all trying to make sure nobody found out anything was going on. Yeah. Um, Quite a typical storyline that it ha mm -hmm. that exactly happened in my family, happened in Beverly's family. Yeah. It's just so common. Mm. But now that we know that, what are we doing about it? What can we do about it? Yeah, yeah. 
I think, I mean, there was aspects of, of that time. I think Scotland has moved on in a lot of ways, um, especially with kind of LGBT progression. I grew up in an environment where the worst thing you could possibly be was gay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but that's very different today. Scotland is, I think, now has the most advanced equality legislation for LGBTQI+. Plus. Um, in, in Europe and I think in the world now so it's a different it, we're not there yet but there has been some mm -hmm. problems yeah but, um you know when now in the work that I do when I when I meet people and I talk about what I do now is and um people kind of feel powerless when you're looking at an issue like this because it's so massive and it's so prevalent mm -hmm. and I say to people like you know you don't have to you don't have to you know get Rishi Sunak by the throat and scream at him you can just change the culture in your household. And that's as simple as tonight before your children go to bed, you can say to them, do you know there's nothing you can't speak to me about? And yeah. a lot of parents kind of say, well, my children know that. And I'm like, well, if that's true, that's good, but it doesn't harm to keep repeating that, you know? Yeah. And as simple as that, you could start to change the culture in the, the home. And we could be the generation that, that stops this just by those simple things that everyone has the power and capacity to do, you know? 100%, I like that. And that's something we also have talked about in the past about consent. Yeah. Enable asking, you know, it doesn't matter how small the, the, the child is, would you like a hug? And if they say no, that's fine. Not you must hug goodbye or kiss such and such goodbye. And that becomes such um, you know, that's that happens in everyday life all the time. And what we do, we disable our children. Mm. Yeah, so I think, yeah what can we do about it that's another thing is education of, of what is consent and that needs to start from primary one right up through high school and we would because as as things look today at the moment there's a there's a real media focus on the amount of abuse that's happening within peers you know within schools and um and so we need to we need to up the effort to to re-educate our youth because they're they're inter the, the way they behave towards each other is different now and it's massively influenced by technology of course we realize that but there but there is practical things we can do people feel like i was saying people feel, feel powerless and like how could you ever stop, stop something like this but actually when the government makes it a priority like like seat belts or or plastic bags when they decide to get behind something and invest in it they can change public behavior on a massive scale so 100%. this is this is preventable you know yeah so, so after going... sorry my fault <laughs> I've said we were going to do this. <laughs> so after that disclosure, what what happened then, Matt? Matthew? Yeah. Well, I kind of thought, you know, in my mind, like now we're going to go to the police and there's going to be this whole courtroom drama that I was trying to avoid because I was I was keeping quiet, thinking that you know there was an incident once where one of my brothers got in trouble and the police brought him home, and I remember my parents being so traumatized by the police coming to our door and what would the neighbors think that I, I kind of knew that the worst thing I could do is bring the police to our door so with the situation that I was having to deal with with my uncle I knew that it was going to involve courts and it was going to involve police so I didn't really want to be the one to blow the whistle because I didn't want to bring all of that to our household when I knew everyone really didn't want to go, go through all that um which is a heavy thing to put on the young victim you know and it's hard to, Looking back, I don't think there was much else I could have done. I, I, for me, I was just trying to survive the situation uh, and keep the peace and try and keep our family together in some form. But um, yeah, so so what happened was nothing. You know, my my dad heard the disclosure, um, and and that was it really. My uncle was banished from the house, which was a relief because then I had to I could stop pretending that everything was fine and I never had to see him again. But we didn't really go beyond that. Everyone just went on with their life and we forgot about it. So or I went... did you, Matthew? Did you forget <laughs> about it? Yeah, that was it. You know, just just uh, tied it up neatly and threw it away. But um, no, um, I actually kind of ran away from home in a sense when I, I finished high school at 17. And I, I would have done anything, literally anything to get out of there. So... I went to Wolverhampton, of all places. Um, I got I offered a position. There used to be this thing in the UK called CSV, which was Community Service Volunteers. Yeah, still you, is. Is that still going? Yeah, oh, CSVs, I'd love to yeah. Because um, they, they came to our school and did a presentation, and I always wanted to be an actor. Like, I wanted to be, work in television and stuff. So 
I knew that at 17, I was too young to get into drama school, um, especially because my brother, who was older than me, had been to drama school and, you know, hadn't really enjoyed it. And he, he was older than me at the time and he still was so, he said it's so much pressure. So I, I felt too young to go straight into uni after school. So I thought I'll take a gap year and CSV offered us, they said, if you apply, we can give you a community project anywhere. And I, I was I was imagining that I'd come to London and I'd work in a homeless shelter and I'd help people for a year and then I'd, and then I'd go to uni. But they offered me, uh, it was a youth theatre for underprivileged kids in quite a deprived part of Wolverhampton. And so that that was my my route out and I left. Um, and that's where I met someone called Rachel. She worked there at the youth theatre. And she's one of these people, you know, she can just, one of these people that just sees through the bullshit. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've all got one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I met her and she was, she was about seven years older than me. And, um, and she worked there with the young people. And she, part of her job was to take the young people from that area to go and see theatre. So we'd take them, I think, to see West Side Story at the Grand in Wolverhampton. And then we dropped them all back at their houses. And she said, do you want to go and get a curry? And of course, in Wolverhampton, this curry house is open till three in the morning. So that was fine. So we went out and she was so disarming that she kind of just, I don't even know how she did it. She just got me to speak and it all, everything came out everything that I, th I didn't realize I was running from. And um, she immediately got me uh, the card of this place called, I think it was Base 25. And it was a free therapy service for young people. And it was all anonymous kind of thing. So I started there. I think that's still going. Um, I went there and I was so terrified of, of disclosing that they might, I thought they might run to the police. So I gave a fake name and stuff. Um, and I started therapy. And I think for me, that's one of the big messages I give to people. Like I started therapy when I was 17 and my brother who'd never spoken about it when he, when he ended up in that hospital bed, he was 25 at that. And he didn't, he tried yeah. to carry this all on his own. And eventually the weight of that just gets too much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if you're older than me, I'm 40 now, if you're older than me, um, you know, it's never too late to begin healing, you know, but I feel that I'm 23 years along the road now of healing and it's it's not a a destination it's a direction i'm just 23 mm -hmm. years on that road you know and it's you still have good days and bad days but um yeah it's never too late to start whilst you was at school and there was all this silence going on around it how did you feel that you fared at school was you quite insular was you quite outgoing how did you present yourself because mm. of what you'd gone through. Yeah, I think uh, I was like safety by being conspicuous. You know, I think I was friends with everyone in the year. Like I wasn't one of the sporty kids or the geeky kids, but I was friends with all of them. I could talk to anyone and I thought that made me safer. I used to make people laugh a lot and that, that, there was mm -hmm. safety in that as well. But um, when I look at, when I look back and I did recently see my school records and my, I, I would always get, complaints from teachers in my reports about daydreaming and staring wow. out the window mm -hmm. I remember particularly I think when I was about nine I remember one situation staring at a boy across the table and just wondering like does his uncle do bad things to him or is it just me and looking around the class and so for such a young child I always had so much on my mind yeah so I was always just kind of lost in the and they're wanting you to look at sums or whatever and I just couldn't yeah. get my head to do that you know 100% Mm. and then towards the end of high school even though like in some classes I would get we used to get awards for you know achievement or excellence or whatever in some classes I would get awards for effort and um, towards the end of school my attendance had dropped to I think below 63 percent I just wasn't really turning up and nobody questioned this nobody thought why is that young person just not functioning you know yeah. which is sad really but I think I, I know that everyone in every school it's so, so overstretched. Every single yeah. personnel in the schools, they've got so much to do. And, you know, we expect them to also have their eyes wide open and examining every child. But I think there was um, there's one thing that I, an anxiety disorder that I've had since a child, which is basically like scratching my head. And I've mm -hmm. always scratched the same point in my head for years. I've got a little cut there that's never healed. Um, and if you look at my school photographs, there's like there was a cut on my nose at one point. 
they didn't heal for at least two years and nobody again you would you would kind of nowadays go what's going on there what's that about mm -hmm. um so i do say to parents or teachers if the young person if you notice a scar or a cut just write down the date that you noticed it and then just check back how long does that take to heal and if it's an unusual length of time then start asking questions because that yeah. could be presenting an anxiety that they're trying to hold it all together you know yeah bev you wanted to say something before i come in <laughs> you're on mute love oh yes <laughs> listening <laughs> to your experience matthew you know thank you for sharing because it's so important and i i find myself nodding my head because you know i go back to because being survivors ourselves there are some things, although your experience is unique, it's same as everybody's, there are some things that have similarities. And when you say about the responsibility on yourself as a young person, God, it's so huge, isn't it? Mm. And then we also then, we not only victim blame, but we, we start to look at the, the symptoms of behaviour. So if it's deemed to be, and I'm going to say bad behaviour, and I don't like saying that, but behavior that isn't what an establishment is looking for like school so not functioning in the class you know not being in school and it gets considered bad behavior it's not that we want everyone to get away with things but I'd mm. like to think now that we look at that more and we do step back and we ask the questions sadly mm. it's getting better but I'm in lots of different forums and it's amazing how how archetypal behavior is still coming through and very judgmental yeah yeah and i think it's important that you're able to share what you're you're saying because thank you because anyone listening now if you're in a place seeing certain behavior that you've heard from matthew ask those you know ask yourself as you said and i think that's a great example that you came, you gave about listing down the date of what you've seen or what's come to mind. Mm -hmm. I also want to pick up on the disassociation, so the, the, the daydreaming. There's so many people, including myself, that I've heard this from. When your brain is in that overwhelm, you're in the survival brain, you're not in your thinking brain. So that straight away means to me that everybody needs to be trauma informed when they're working with children because if they don't have this basic knowledge of actually if someone is potentially daydreaming are they daydreaming or is something else going on because a mm. child cannot think and cannot learn when they're in survival brain that that's just fact okay mm. so this daydreaming or dissociation or whatever you want to call it is is a sign and symptom potentially and the scratching I know my sister used to literally scratch her arms red raw and I used to say to her stop doing that stop doing it why are you doing that and I used to get quite irate with her because I could see how red raw her arms were and I'm like even back then I didn't know the question why are you doing it you know mm. I, I didn't know to ask that question but I, I said to her what's going on for you because that to me is just a sign of distress what yeah. is going on and I asked that question for quite a few times before she actually told me what was happening to her um so you saying about having something that you pick at or whatever biting the nails going to the quicks mm -hmm. you know something it is a sign of distress so those signs and symptoms could be looked at quite easily and the questions asked and, you know, the mandatory reporting recommendation that the government um, are going to bring in, what it looks like, we don't know. But obviously, um, proper disclosures have to be put through the system. But signs and symptoms is also part of that if they go with it. So I think us talking about just these basic things will be an eye opener to some professionals who potentially are listening to this. So I'm going to shut up there and draw the line for a moment. Um, how did your brother recover, Matthew, or not? Well, what? How did his life sort of like turn out? Yeah. Um, so he um, he was fortunate in the sense that he 
he fell in love with a pharmacist so she, <laughs> she was able to help him in many ways um help him like because he has to he did a lot of therapy but he also he kind of lent on medication to help him kind of come out of that that overwhelmed state um and so he manages his life now in that way um and he, he has had you know good periods and bad periods but I will say that he, when he was very young, when he was about 18, he did a thing called the pledge, which is a Catholic thing where you decide that you're never going to drink alcohol. Um, and I think in his case, that really saved his life. I think um, because, yeah, I personally have had periods where I've, I've, you know, been really, really heavily off the rails with alcohol. Um, and the weird thing is because I'm, I've been in therapy for 23 years or, you know, on and off, I'm so mm-hmm. self-aware that I I watch myself when I'm in periods of maximum stress and I and I allow myself to to use alcohol or use a substance because I know that I'm going through something and I'm going, yeah. to, I'm going to come at the other side. Um but yeah, I think yeah, that for him that was that was a saving grace. But I think like for many survivors there's so much shame about not being able to function mm-hmm. when we're so, you know, it, it's we hide the fact that we're struggling from our partners and from people because we're so sad that we can't keep up, you know, well, that's been my experience. Uh, a friend of mine started a company called Rethink Drink, which is um, one of the, one of the only companies in the, in the UK that does the Sinclair method, which if you're aware of it, I, I think it's the world's best case, kept secret. Um, it's so basically oh, there's in the 1930s, they started AA, which is Alcohol Anonymous, yeah. Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and at that point in the 1930s, even the guy that created AA said, at the moment, there's no solution to alcohol addiction. One day medical science might solve it, but at the moment, you just have to stop. And for a lot of survivors, they rely on substance abuse for you know to cope. Mm-hmm. Anyway, in the 1990s, they, they, they found a thing that's called the Sinclair method, and there's a pill that you can take called nal- naltrexone. You take the pill, and what it does is it inhibits the alcohol uh, dopamine receptors of alcohol so you don't actually get anything from alcohol so instead of stopping drinking completely you can keep drinking the rest of your life but your interest in alcohol is gone so very quickly it's called rethink drink because what you you stop getting what you always got from alcohol and you, you actually re change your relationship to it and it can really help with i mean it's literally like getting your life back in control of yourself and control of your emotions so yeah if, if there's any survivors who are struggling with alcohol i would first thing do is direct them towards that because i think um complete abstinence has, hasn't worked for a lot of people i think i don't want to throw random statistics out but it's quite high but until you deal with the root cause, you're not going to be able to deal with the um, the coping mechanism because yeah. it's just like you always go back to your default, which gives you a little bit of reprieve or a little bit of um, just like you're taking yourself away from all of the distress and the emotions mm-hmm. that you're feeling. So, you know, it's understandable that there is addictions, different ones, whether it be food, exercise, sex, alcohol drugs you know they're all coping mechanisms and we all will default to something because why wouldn't you when you're in distress you know yeah and I think like today with you know we'll get on to that but the work that I do now trying to convince people to do things or change things very often they're not interested in the personal story they're not really governments are not compassionate they don't actually care on an individual Mm -hmm. level they can't care because there's too many of us what they do care about is numbers they care about money and so if you can show a government how much money are we spending every year on homelessness or alcoholism or even things like um of course obesity all these things have been tracked now since the late 90s in the adverse childhood experience study that i'm sure you've covered the study showed that all of these are outcomes from childhood sexual violence and other negative childhood experiences and all of those things would be drastically reduced if, if we as a as a generation comprehensively focused on preventing childhood sexual abuse and, and exploitation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and it suppose when you show how much money they would save, they start to listen. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, so Beverly, you. you've got so much to uh, share with Matthew because obviously you've um I'm not saying you're an alcoholic because you haven't, but you 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 had a relationship where there was an alcoholic within the relationship, didn't you? You yeah. had to deal with all of that. So yeah. do you want to share just a little bit of how you were a survivor, but working with that as well? Well, to be honest, so that 
the other angle came from it. So I have to be careful because of whose story I'm sharing. So yeah. I'm just going to give an overflow. But um, a person very close to me has an addiction and they were in rehab. And when they came out, they spoke about Al-Anon. I'd never heard of Al-Anon. And for anyone listening, it's if um, it's for someone who, someone around you has um not even an addiction, if you feel that somebody is drinking too much to their detriment. Mm. And I was advised to go by this person. And what I didn't know was my partner at the time, sadly, was an alcoholic and didn't realise. Um, went along to Ellen on and realised my parents were alcoholics and the pattern was there. And mm. it's And what I was also doing was, I was enabling, not on purpose, but what you think is love, I was enabling. So what I was doing was disabling. Yeah. And you re- and this is something people don't understand because the person who's on drink, you know, it, it, it's like a, a ripple effect. I will say that I'm going to call it drugs because drink is a drugs. And it, and it, for some people, not for everyone, but for some people it goes on. So it's, I've seen it from the other side as well. And I think because I've seen it as a young kid as well, that was my reason for being very self-aware around alcohol. So even as a youngster, I didn't drink for 10 years. And even now, I drink if I feel safe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If I don't feel safe, I'll drink water all night. Yeah. So, And I just want to share that as a, a different concept because it's so important that we're able to have these conversations without judgment. But mm. if we don't have conversations about abuse, about addiction, how do we know? Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. And, and I my, grew up with, sorry, Bev. No, I was going to say my, co- you know, my coping mechanism when I, I get challenged is keeping busy, keeping mm-hmm. very right. busy. So yeah. I now have to balance that and I work very hard to keep that balance with self-care. Like mm-hmm. if I'm working hard, what time have I put in the diary to take out? Because it otherwise it becomes an addiction, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. So Matthew as well. I grew up with um, alcohol in a negative way. Um, that's when the vi- the actual violence got worse, and I hated anybody. And I know that's a strong word to use, but it it was my reality. I hated anybody that drank because I associated it with violence, abuse. Um, and me just not being safe. And I didn't drink until I was probably about 45. I'm 53 now. And I now can see and feel mm. safe in drinking a little bit myself mm. um, for pleasure, not for, you know, handling distress or anything like that. But I was so against anybody that drank alcohol because of the early associations. So it's really just us sharing what's going on with us three, how different it is for each and every single one of us. Mm, Can yeah. I um say, in coming up, um, living in a Scottish family, alcohol's an everyday thing, is it? Or is that just a, a, a myth? Is it a reality or a myth? Yeah, it- I mean, it, it is very much, I mean, the, the, the stereotype is very accurate, I think. You know, in Scotland, we have... The same bottle of wine will cost more in Scotland in Lidl's than the, in Lidl's in England because we we had to raise the 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 price of the of a unit of alcohol to try and reduce people drinking. And you can't buy alcohol in the morning before 10, 10 a.m. Mm-hmm. Um, sadly, and I I think like I thought that was unique to Scotland. In fact, you know I've worked across Scandinavia, and all the countries where it's dark for three months of the year and the alcohol is as much seems to be much higher. You know. So I think it is, it's, there's a number of factors involved, but for the work that I do now and the, the travel that I do, it, every culture has its booze, you know, and everywhere I go, everyone wants me to try their thing. So it's not possible for me to, to not drink um, mm-hmm. without, uh, literally without upsetting diplomatic relationships in some situations. <laughs> so uh, you have to go, okay, and try it. So yeah, yeah so I've found the kind of rethink drink uh, process for me has been a life a lifesaver, really. Um, so I would recommend it to anyone who's struggling. And I think that's great. And we will add that link as well mm-hmm. underneath either the video if someone's watching this or the audio, because it's so important because one situation doesn't 
fit or one resolution doesn't fit for everyone. So that's fantastic. Yeah. So obviously there's loads to speak about and we don't want to keep holding you back, Matthew. And can I just put in for the listeners, I actually have Scottish heritage as well. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm married to, my husband has got Irish um, descent as well. So we're very Irish Scottish. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, literally, I don't don't see borders. I think we are literally go back a few generations and we've all got the same great, great, great grandfather. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, So, yeah. So basically I went to, I went to England to do a, a gap year, uh, started therapy, and then I managed to get into uni to do to drama school to become an actor. So, and that's what I did. I went to, I got in at Queen Margaret in Edinburgh, studied acting for three years, straight out of drama school. I uh, got an agent and I started, I did Taggart, you know that show? Yes. Oh my God, did you? I love Taggart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was in that, um, and then I was in a kids' TV show on CBBS called Me Too. Unfortunately, um, yeah, it was on every every morning on CBBS. So, within a couple of months of coming out of drama school, I was, yeah, I was kind of becoming a known actor in in some circles, um, and at that point, m- no one had really spoken about our uncle, and he was still registered as a school teacher, and he was still working with wow. young boys. Wow, and uh, I think. What happened was one of my brothers, one of my other brothers, who we'd never had a conversation about the whole situation with, um, his wife called me and said that he was struggling. And and then I went, okay, this is, you know, this is what happens. Eventually, you, it, it just catches up with you. So yeah. So I went over to see him. He, he lives in Ireland. and um, And it was so difficult. How do we begin the conversation, you know? We had to get blind drunk and we're standing outside his house in the rural Ireland where it was pitch black. There was no street lights. We had to have this middle of the night, completely drunk uh, circumstance before we could even approach it. Um, and then I came home to Scotland and I was so furious all over again because mm. this brother was now collapsing and, and the other one was kind of self-medicating. And all of us, all of our lives were really uh, difficult. And the person who created all of this was still just carrying on. Yeah. And, and that's when it terrified me that our silence was quite dangerous. By not mm-hmm. by not reporting him, we were just allowing a very dangerous man to work in schools. So, again, because it's so difficult to speak to your brother about it, at that point I worked in theatre and television. So I wrote a play, a play called To Kill a Kelpie. Um, a Kelpie is like a, a Scottish water creature it's like a the Loch Ness monster is a kelpie but there's a legend around the kelpie which is that when you would see him at the side of the loch he would be he would appear as a charming man to kind of lure you towards him wow. when, you got, when you got close he would grab you and drown you in the loch so oh. that seemed like a good metaphor for yeah 100 <laughs> percent. and there was also um there was a thing that also I watched this thing about phobia about phobias and apparently a phobia is your brain chooses something. Like if you're afraid of spiders or snakes or rats, you're not actually scared of of spiders because you know rationally that it's not dangerous, if you, especially in the UK. But what you're actually scared of is the reaction and the feeling, and you've chosen this thing as the kind of icon for that feeling. So, that, yeah, so because like famously, Jade Goody was scared of ketchup. Now, you can't be Not scared she. of ketchup. Apparently. Wow. So okay. I don't know what happened when she was maybe three or she either yeah. saw someone covered in blood and thought it was ketchup or she saw someone covered in ketchup and thought it was blood. But some trauma happened before her mind could rationalise it. And today, or as she was, uh, apparently she was scared of ketchup. It was in this documentary and it made me think, what am I scared of? And I'm really scared of getting in the water. I don't like the idea of standing in water. And I realised that, that I'm not scared of sea creatures or kelpies. It's that feeling of lying there with your eyes closed and something can come at you from below and you have no power over that. And so that's really what the, the whole thing just made sense to me that that's, that's what that was. So I wrote the play about um, about two brothers and who've been abused by the same uncle. And all that happens in the play is that they talk about it. Um, in reality, there was four of us. In the play, it's twin brothers because like in medical experiments, they use twins. So... Um, one brother in the play had been to therapy and the other one hadn't. And it was just about showing how, even though the one who'd been to therapy seems to be like the emotional one and like he's not coping because he cries a lot, he's actually processing everything. And the one who 
doesn't talk about it, who's stoic and he's fine. He's the one in the play that doesn't he realize hasn't functioned at all. So the play was performed in Glasgow in 2007. We invited um, Sandra Brown, OBE. She's the founder of the Moira Anderson Foundation in Scotland. That's kind of the, the most advanced uh, organization, certainly at that time, who help child and adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. I invited her to come to the show and to host a post-show discussion. And my brothers, I warned them what, what I'd written about. Uh, they came to see it. And then she led this conversation. And that was the first time that we openly were able to sit around and just say what was what had, what had occurred and what needed to happen. So within a few days of the play, we decided to we were going to uh, press charges and we reported them. So after two decades of silence, within just a few days of the play, our uncle was arrested. And then he was uh, prosecuted and he pled guilty based on the weight of our evidence. And uh, he went to jail. But um, I, I kind of realised that the play, which was fiction, it was based on real life, but it was a, it was a story. It had created this massive, important change in my family. So I thought maybe it would work for other families. So I collaborated with different organisations and we toured it. Um, in the US and in different places in Europe. Um, wherever we showed the play, people in the audience would disclose to me. Sometimes I, I would walk on stage and have a conversation and sometimes they'd approach me in the bar and I would get a lot of disclosures. And I would always couple the, try and invite the local service provider so that people knew immediately who they could get help with. But I would say to people, you should press charges, especially if your offender is still in contact with children. And um, many people in different nations would say we can't because we've missed our chance because of the statute of limitations has run out. And I'd never heard of that because we don't have it in Scotland. So yeah. I just assumed I had these rose-tinted specs that if you press charges, the police come, take them away, yeah. goes to jail, sorted. That is not the case for the vast Wouldn't majority. It would be beautiful if it did work like that, hey? <laughs> but I think, and it took me a long time to realise that my experience was you know, quite unusual. I was one of the they say lucky ones who actually got a prosecution. <clears throat> but um, so that's when I learned about this thing called the statute of limitations, the time limit on reporting. Yeah. And that's when I kind of transitioned from being just someone who was an actor and writer into someone who became a, an advocate and an activist. So I, I had this idea and the idea was very simple, which was to show the play or the play. We made a movie version of the play so that we could stop performing it because it's quite exhausting. So my, my idea was to show the film of the play everywhere and then speak to the audience. I thought we'll show it everywhere across Europe. And I thought, and then we'll encourage everyone in the audience to to raise up against their government and get that law changed. I thought it was a simple concept. We went to That's 200 good companies. good concept. Yeah, yeah simple, simple, the simple ideas <laughs> are the best. good. Um, I went to 200 companies thinking someone will give us money. We got nothing, not a single penny. So eventually the decision was made that I was just I would just walk around Europe um, instead of flying from city to city. I would walk on my, on my own. Um, and that's how the concept of the, the project began. And so on May 31st, 2013, I left London on foot and I walked to Paris and then I walked to Luxembourg and then uh, Brussels. And I carried on until I walked to the capital city of every EU country. Um, and so there was a, a team around me, about five organizations internationally collaborated to help me do this project. Um, we had volunteers over the course of the whole, it took nearly two years to walk around Europe, but over the course of the whole project, there was six different people that drove this van that um, where I slept every night. The van would drive 30 miles and I would sleep in the van at the side of the road. Then it would drive another 30 miles. That's very slowly how I moved around the continent. Um, but when I got to the city, um, I would go to the British Embassy, who were, as as the project went on, it, there was bigger and bigger profile of what I was doing. And the British Embassies were always really um, accommodating. They would help me get to the press. They would help me get to the governments. So I met justice ministers and family ministers of all these different nations. And I was able to strangely just build this kind of momentum. And what I was asking them to do was very simple. And I was able to say, if my uncle had sexually abused me and my brothers in this country, you would not arrest them. You would leave a dangerous child sex offender working in the school because of this law. And they would say, no, that's not true. And I would say, well, yes, it is. Look at, look at your penal code. You're not giving the survivors enough time to, and you're also not providing them with any emotional support 
for them to reach the point where they can speak about it. So the chances of this ever stopping with the statute of limitations is kind of bleak. So, yeah, so I walked around Europe and in doing so, I got invited to meet the Pope. I met Pope Francis. I got invited to meet, um, to speak at the United Nations. And then eventually what happened was in Croatia, I was speaking to the government in Croatia and I said, you need to remove this law. And they said, well, we can't abolish that because we've only just created it. <laughs> and I was like, why, why, why have you just brought in a law that other governments are in the process of removing a dangerous law that stops victims pressing charges and leaves dangerous individuals in contact with children. And they said to me, when we ratified the Lanzarote Convention, we were required to bring in a statute of limitations. So just to explain, I'd never heard of that. The Lanzarote no. Convention was a treaty that was that all governments in Europe created on prevention and tackling childhood sexual violence, it's called, in, um, in all European nations. All governments have now signed it. And so everyone in Europe is should be protected by this treaty. All governments are supposed to um, align their national legislation with that international agreement. And there's an article, Article 33 said, your, your statute of limitations must be sufficient to allow victims time to come forward. Now, that's very vague. It doesn't say mm. what's sufficient. That's very subjective. It was also written on the assumption that your country has a limitation. And Croatia didn't. But because of the way it was worded, they actually brought in a limitation. And so a treaty that was supposed to improve child protection and end childhood sexual violence had actually inhibited the human rights of, you know, I think four million, a country of four million for generations of children. Yeah. So I said, well, how do we fix that? How do we change that, 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 that one paragraph, which has created this catastrophic mistake? And in order to change that, you have to go to the center of Europe. So to explain, I was walking around the EU, which was 27 countries, but Europe's obviously bigger than just the EU. There's also Norway and Serbia and um, all in Switzerland, all of the countries in Europe, there's 47, they all meet in Strasbourg and that's called the Council of Europe and that's who created this treaty. And I think like, I'll, I'll be honest, it was the week that Scotland voted no in the independence referendum. So I was, I was, I was a bit miffed. Because <laughs> so, I was like, I really thought what Scotland would get it would go for independence, and they didn't. And I'd like, I lived in England most of my life. I'm not to be pro Scottish independence was never to be anti English. I just think that the um, I was walking around Europe in a kilt, you know, and I had a big salt iron mm. on my chest. I was very identifiably Scottish. Yeah. So I was quite in that point. I was I was walking at that time from Geneva, having just spoke at the UN. I was walking to Madrid, across the Pyrenees, and. I was so angry. I just phoned up the Council of Europe and I said, I need to speak to whoever created that document because we need to talk about what has to change now. And the kind of, you know that thing, if you can keep a cool head whilst those around you are losing theirs, you probably <laughs> haven't grasped the situation. <laughs> it's like, it was my blind ignorance as to the scale of what I was doing. Like I just thought I'll phone up the Council of Europe. Um, and somehow they opened the doors, I think because I'd met the Pope and I'd been at the UN. Uh, they opened the doors and I managed to go up there and I, I met the the secretary general who was the in charge of the whole of I mean he's the he was the chair of the Nobel Peace Prize committee um the highest kind of politician in Europe and I said to him you need to fix this uh, I need to speak to the committee in charge of that treaty and we need to change it so that was like he said to me well you know to get 47 governments in a room you can't arrange it next week so he said Come Are back. you like, why not? <laughs> Just find I was them. like, but this is a bit really urgent. You know? um, he said, come back next year. So I finished the walk. Um, I, I went then from Spain to Portugal, back up through. I went to Cardiff in um, Dublin, Belfast, and eventually finished in Edinburgh in February 2015. And that was the end of that walk project. But the my mission wasn't ended. So I went back to Strasbourg. And I addressed all those governments and I asked them to change that article of that treaty. And they listened to me, but they didn't take any action at that point. So after that, I collapsed from exhaustion um, and I kind of didn't do anything for a while. Um, and then I was invited to, to the UN to kind of chair, start chairing some debates on children's rights as a survivor, just, as, just from what I'd observed, because I'd worked with survivors and so many countries and I had such a unique kind of understanding of where everyone was at that time. 
So the UN brought me in to, to chair some discussions. And whilst I was doing that, I was seen by the, the CEO of ECPAT International. They're based in Bangkok, but they're one of the world's biggest organizations who fight childhood sexual exploitation. So I ended up in Asia and they asked me to find all the other people like me, all the other angry survivors who have had enough. Um, so I reached out and we, we did this event called the Global Survivor Forum. And we brought together survivor act activists from as many countries as we could find. And, uh, and we held this Congress. And I think 80 governments listened in to that. I remember at that point it was Obama's administration was listening. And we just, it was all survivors and we talked about what needs to change and how we could change it. And we offered solutions. Um, and we wanted that to become an annual thing. Um, that was then in 2017, we did that. Um, but we went and applied for money to make this an annual thing. And of course, there's a, a lot of logistical um, things to think about if you're bringing survivors together to to voice their experience in front of such a, a massive group of governments. So so after that, I, I collapsed from exhaustion again, um, just complete overwhelm. And there was a pattern emerging, which was me pushing and pushing and pushing and trying to mm. change the world and it not happening fast enough and me just collapsing under the weight of it. So I can so um, recognize myself in you right now. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so I think after that Thank in 2018, you, Chris. Yeah. I think there was a thing about and you you've probably seen this, Chris, with 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 Ixit. I think when you're trying to fix something on a national or international scale, it, it feels so it feels so long between the conversation you're having with one politician or government minister, between the conversation you're having where a decision might be made, and it might be months or even years before the conversation you've just had affects the people who need the help. Yeah. The and so I felt so distant that I wasn't, even though I was having all these stratospheric conversations, I wasn't really doing anything. I wasn't really helping anyone. So that's when I wrote the book. I wrote a book for young people. Um, because I just wanted to speak directly to yeah to young people and and say this is how I this is how I got from where I was to where I am and um so yeah so that was that was my attempt to speak directly to a young survivor and say these these are the choices you can make and the things you can do to help yourself um, and I think that so that was mostly what I did and then COVID came along um, and I got a phone call from Washington DC. Um, from Dr. Daniela Leguero, and she's she runs Together for Girls in Washington, and she's a survivor, and she wanted to do what we'd done with the Global Survivor Forum on a much bigger scale, bring all the survivors in the world together and end uh, all childhood sexual abuse and exploitation globally. Um, and I just loved the ambition of that. So she invited me to become part of this group called The Sage, which was the Survivor Advocates Globally Empowered and together, we created a thing called the Brave Movement, which launched in March 2022. The Brave Movement is, I think, the biggest global effort of survivor voices coming together to really, this time, to draw a line under this strange thing that happens in humanity. So that's, the Brave Movement has been going for a year and a half now. Oh no, actually, next, nearly two years, wow, nearly two years. <laughs> and the weird thing is, um, I went back to Strasbourg and I... I got, went back into that room who let me speak and I asked them again, the same thing I asked them 10 years ago to change that treaty. But this time I'm not Matthew on his own, that survivor from Scotland. I represent the entire Brave Movement, which is a collaboration of all the survivor voices. And of course they couldn't ignore us this time. So they took action um, and they've now published a reinterpretation of Article 33, which will change that legislation across Europe. And now um, it will have impacts because like Japan is an observer, Tunisia has just joined the treaty, um, Mexico is about to ratify it. So this this one thing will start to infiltrate and change positively the entire world. So it's it's a real honour to be part of this work and it, it blows my mind where we've ended up from where I started. It blows I, I our minds. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't say thank you enough for sharing, you know, that journey. And that really is just a quick synopsis, not Synopsis, say, well, synopsis, I can't get my teeth <laughs> back in. Um, I just need to also bring to attention, we've got five minutes. And I yeah, know I'm fine. the gatekeeper. That's fine. But um, Matthew, you know, anyone listening, what I've heard from you is, and I love that 
that you want to change something and you you do the simplest of things. And I really get that feeling now when you have a conversation and it takes forever to get to the the, the person that really want would make a difference to. But you know what? I'm going to say thank you. Thank you for keep taking each step and following. And that's not a pun, knowing that you've walked around Europe. But like you say, 16,000 kilometres. I know. I've, I wrote that down earlier. <laughs> 16,000 kilometres. That is amazing. But by doing that, you know, you haven't just done it nationally you've done it in the european you've done it worldwide and 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 bring in so many other people together is amazing so the links such as the brave movement as well you know anybody who wants any more information after listening to this please contact us you can email us on breaking the cycle to step forward at gmail.com we will put some links underneath but if we put every single link <laughs> there won't be enough space um, your book, we will definitely put your link on. So let I me think... just say, it's the truth that no one tells teenagers. Ten facts, every teen victim has the right to know. By Matthew that... McVarish. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so Matthew, in the last sort of few minutes that we have, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You've done this so far. What's happening now? You know, how is going forward now? What is it that anyone listening to you would want to guide them to? You know, this is your last few minutes to sort of find a way to just share where you are right now or what's going to happen in the future, what you'd like to see. Yeah, so at the moment, like the Brave Movement was a global initiative. And what's happening is we're now in the process of making sure the Brave Movement has a solid presence in every country. So I'm setting up Brave UK, um, and uh, we're also, at the moment, we have Brave France now, we have Brave Japan. So if you're listening this to this from another country, you know, you can join the Brave Movement, and all it needs is anyone can join. You don't have to be a survivor. It's for survivors and allies and anyone who wants the world to be a better place for children. Um, and any two members of the Brave Movement can create a national platform. So we want there to be Brave everywhere. Um, and there's no pressure on any one individual to solve this, but together we can solve this. So it's it's as simple as coming together. So if you go into the bravemovement.org, you can join and then you'll start getting more information about how to take action in your area, no matter where you are. Yeah, thank you. And thank what's, you so much. What's next for you though, Matthew, on a personal level? What, what a personal do you level? want to do? Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be work. Yeah, yeah. I still, I still write uh, television. I write for BBC Scotland. I write a show called River City now, and um, I've got a new Christmas movie that I've written that I'm hopefully pushing out in production this year. So I still do that part of my life, which helps balance out the the heavy stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm back in Strasbourg um in three weeks, and we have the final vote on the new amendment to the treaty, and that feels like the full circle coming to the end of the the activism, not the end of the activism, but the end of that first push. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, there's it's only the beginning. There's so much then to be done. So, yeah, yeah, I think what's next is, yeah, just take the next step. Keep going. And can I ask one last question, Matthew? Mm -hmm. Thinking back to your 15-year-old self, if you could stand in front of, you know, 15-year-old Matthew, what would you want to say to him now? Um, I think I say it a lot in my book. I say, um, you're going to be okay. I think that was the one thing I didn't know, yeah. um, you know, because you can't see how that's true. But you are going to be OK. And there is, there is um, yeah, there is so much you can do to get out of this. So, um, yeah. Just keep keep um, keep reaching out, I think. That's the thing. Just turn. I think in my book, I say um, if you've been abused, it feels like a very strange gift because you can use it to turn away from the world and say, why should I care? Because I've mm -hmm. been. But the other thing you can do with that is you can use it as your reason to fully live the rest of your life. If you turn towards the world and say, I understand because I have been hurt too. And I think yeah. if you do that, you have such a, a different life. That's beautiful. Um, Chris, because sadly we are coming to an end as much as we don't want to end it. Any last thoughts from yourself? 
I just think we are in the presence of an amazing man and he probably doesn't like me saying that, but I'm just so humbled by who you are, what you've achieved and I'm learning myself because I'm following in your footsteps, Matthew. I'm learning from you about what I need to do. Bless you. Well, it's been an honour being on your show. Like I'm getting addicted to it, walking the dog and I've got a lot of episodes to listen to. So <laughs> thank you so much for having me today. It's been a pleasure. Well, yeah. thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you. You know, thank you so much. And as we said, you know, anybody listening or watching, please, self-care is always important. That's something we always say. Um, but they were beautiful words that Matthew shared. And I just want to say thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. If anyone has any questions, just reach out. You can reach out to us. You can reach out to the Brave Movement. We will be putting some links under, but know that you're not alone. And if you're not a survivor, but you want to learn more, you're always welcome as well. That's what this is all about. Opening conversations to educate and raise awareness. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Matthew. Time to say goodbye. Bye. Nice, Till next goodbye. time. Bye.